You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. Today, I am joined by a lovely lady from London who's gone and done a rather remarkable thing, made tradition fashionable. Well, at least in her neighborhood school, the Michaela Community School, She's referred to as the strictest headmistress in Britain. And Catherine Burblesing is now leading an educational renaissance by bringing the tradition to life for her students and the faculty who instruct them. Catherine, thank you for joining us today. It's lovely to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about this Michaela Community School that's been getting such rave reviews. Yeah, well, I mean, rave reviews and also lots of people who attack us, <laughs> mm. depending on whether you are pro-traditionalism or very much against it. We opened in 2014. We are what's called a free school in Britain, which is based on the model of charter schools in America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, and then that means a group of people have set it up. Uh, and we, I have to say we have a similar admissions policy as you would do um, to all the other local schools. And it's the local council that gives us our kids. And um, how are we traditional? Well, our curriculum is traditional. Um, our behavior is traditional, which is why they call me the strictest headmistress in Britain, because uh, we have very high standards when it comes to behavior. And I'd say our values are very traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, the values that we have would have been perfectly normal in the 1950s, whereas now they, they seem slightly odd, is what I'd say, mm -hmm. and out of place. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but yeah. Michaela, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely place to be because we all buy into those values. It is, and I, I was very fortunate. You were very generous in hosting me earlier this year. I was delighted and, and rather, quite honestly, just to, totally impressed with what I was seeing. But I didn't get, you know, in the course of our conversation, the full reading of your background. How is it that you came to this model of education and how did you come to lead Michaela? Yeah, well, I grew up in Canada, actually, in Toronto and went to normal public schools. And then um, I came over to England when I was 15 because my dad was an English professor. And so he was sort of posted out here in a university and I, we came over and then my sister and my parents went back and I ended up staying and I wasn't meant to stay for very long. But in the end, I ended up going to Oxford University and then I ended up staying and I've sort of never left. So mm -hmm. I've now been here for over 30 years. I've always been in teaching. I love it. I've always worked in the inner city with uh, disadvantaged kids. And um, I suppose I've always been fighting for them. And I believe sincerely that uh, they, if we want to enable social mobility for these kids, we need to give them uh, the skills and the knowledge that will allow them to succeed later. And I believe the only way of doing that is via a traditional education with traditional values. Mm -hmm. And so we set up our school I had to set up a school because, frankly, in the system, it was impossible to make this sort of thing happen. So I was kicked out of the education system uh, because I gave a speech in 2010 at the Conservative Party conference. I didn't really know that much about politics. I was a bit naive. I went along and gave the speech. I said that the education system was broken. People were outraged by this, and I was essentially kicked out of the system. And so, you know, my, my position on that is that you're not really allowed as an educator to side with the conservatives. Mm. And um, I suppose that's what I did. And then as I was kicked out, the only way to really get myself back into the world of working with disadvantaged kids was to set up my own school. So that's what we did. We opened in 2014 with 120 kids. We now have nearly 800, uh, and they go from year seven, so grade seven, as you would say, all the way up to uh, year 13, when mm -hmm. they leave us to go to university. And we have kids going off to Oxford and Cambridge. We have um, them going to some of the top universities in, in, the, in the country. And it, it, even the ones, you know, they're, they're also those who become plumbers and, and hairdressers and all, all kinds of different um, sure. professions. Uh, but they all turn up on time. They all know how to be polite. They all know how to be grateful for whatever it is they have in life, no matter how little it is. They all know how to be decent human beings, which I think um, is part of the point of school. You know, it's not mm. just about learning academic stuff. It's about uh, it's about the whole child. So um, we've been doing that now for nearly eight years. Uh, we've caused a lot of controversy here in, in England because a lot of people don't like what we do. 
So a lot of people attack us. I'm regularly attacked on places like Twitter. I mean, look, I've even received death threats. I mean, mm. believe it or not. Um, and it was a real fight. It took us three and a half years to set up the school because there were so many people trying to stop us. People protested outside. They had big banners insulting me. We had to hire bouncers in order to uh, get our parents' evenings to happen because people were coming in and infiltrating and trying to stop us. I mean, I, I could spend the whole webinar, frankly, talking about this. Goodness. But um, it's been a real fight. We succeeded. And then, of course, now we've got up to 1,000 guests coming uh, every year who are in it. So I just spoke to a group of them. There were about five or six of them in today, mainly teachers. And they're teachers from around the country and teachers from the US as well, Australia, Germany, Canada, all over. And they come to really see what we're doing. And as the guest said to me today, we've never seen anything like it. It's extraordinary. One of the guests said, who's a teacher, she said, I just don't understand it. Why is it that everyone isn't, why is everyone not doing the same thing? But of course, that's a that's a big question, and and it has a complex answer. Well, it is, and I and I realize we could go down the rabbit hole, as they say. But I'm fascinated by the fact that this uh, approach to knowledge, skills, uh, punctuality, uh, civility, that this is radical. Yes. So I, I I'm trying to understand what's so radical, and in what sense the uh, those who have opposed you. Yeah. do so on what grounds what do they what do they take issue with okay so they might say that we're too extreme so for instance we have silent corridors which means that the children walk in silence and single file to their lessons and as a result they get to their lessons within a minute and a half the transitions are super quick they're in their lessons learning quickly without any nonsense mm -hmm. um now some people will say why do you why do you need them to be silent why don't you just let them chat because they imagine that the children are skipping along the corridors chatting about aristotle and isn't life wonderful when the reality is in the inner city the children are getting into fights they're smashing each other against the walls they're running up and down screaming and slamming doors and so on that's not happening here of course mm -hmm. i'm just saying that that might happen in a typical inner city school Whereas when you go to the extent of saying, okay, you know what, let's just have silence in the corridors, it means that the children don't get beaten up. It means that they're safe and secure and they get to their lessons quickly. And when you want to, you have 11 year olds who have the reading age of a seven year old, you very much want to catch them up, which means mm -hmm. you want them in their lessons for most of the time. You do not want them turning up 10, 15 minutes late, slamming the door open, everybody bursts into laughter, there's more disruption. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that be, can be quite normalized in an, mm -hmm. in an ordinary school. So, <clears throat> but, but then people say, oh, but you shouldn't have silent corridors because somehow that's oppressive towards children. You know, the other day I tweeted um, that, so in, in our country at 16, children have national exams, which are called GCSE exams. Your mm -hmm. SATs, I suppose, might be the equivalent. Yeah, yeah. And they're very, very, very important. For the rest of your life, you're going to have to put them on your resume when you're applying for jobs and the grades that you got. Um, the, the, the exams are coming up in four months' time for kids who are in year 11. Uh, a, a father wrote to me on Twitter saying, my child is in year 11. What should I do to help support him? And I said, well, you want to be doing a minimum? He wants to be doing a minimum of three hours of study per night. Uh, four would be good, but a minimum of three. Uh, this is for the next four months, I'm suggesting, in the run-up towards his exams. There was outrage on Twitter. How dare I want children to work so hard? How mm. cruel of me? And I was saying, but if we want these kids to be able to compete, <laughs> because some kids are going to do that work, right? And some kids are going to get the best grades they can get. Right. If more kids don't do that work, then they're not going to get the best grades that they mm -hmm. can get, which seems like a silly thing to me. But in this day and age of 2023, uh, we've become very relaxed and very entitled. And we think that um, things should be given to us for free. And mm -hmm. so I shouldn't have to work. Well, I should just get these grades for nothing. And if I don't get the grades, well, then you just need to fix the quotas on those job mm -hmm. applications so that I, I get in. You know, and um, I just don't agree with that. I think that we all need to work hard. Our motto is work hard, be kind. So like I said, there, and those are those two things that we want the children to be. We want them to work hard for their exams, do really well and learn stuff about the world and appreciate it and become the kind of person who thinks about the world as you walk down the street. Mm -hmm. We also want them to be kind, decent people who help other people, who are grateful for what they have, who um, <clears throat> are kind. Somebody has lost their pen, you lend them a pen. 
Um, you know, if you came to visit us in our uh, uh, canteen, I call it canteen, it's not really a canteen, it's a dining hall. Yeah. Um, the children have what's called a family lunch and they serve each other the food. So they go up, they have different roles and they come back to their table. They always have the same seat where they're sitting on the same table every day. And then they serve each other the food. They pour water for each other as if it were a family dinner. That's why we call it family lunch. Sure. And when they're doing that, they're being kind to each other. They're, 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 they're serving each other. At the end, somebody takes a wet cloth and wipes the table down for everyone. This is kindness. Um, and at the end of the uh, lunch, they stand up and they give appreciations. I'm really grateful for my mom waking me up this morning. And then we do a clap. One, two, and we all clap. And there's a real sense of uh, decency. And like you say, civility. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I think we should have for children, be working hard and being kind. And, you know, you will know the story, of course, of Kip. Um, your charter chain across mm -hmm, America, mm -hmm. those two guys who have done the most brilliant job of, of setting up this amazing charter chain, transforming the lives of these children in the inner city. And their motto used to be work hard, be nice. Mm -hmm. And we actually just copied them. And so <laughs> but we decided it couldn't be exactly the same. So we we changed it to work hard, be kind. And, um, and I think it's a great motto. And if at the very least you get the kids to do those two things by the time they leave you, you want them to do lots of other things, but at sure. the very minimum, you've got that. Brilliant. Poor Kip, after uh, George Floyd and the, the, the that summer, uh, they were then accused of racism for having this motto. And mm. the reason they were accused of having ra being racist was because if white teachers are teaching black children to be nice, then that is somehow teaching them to be subservient. And so Kip were forced to change their motto from work hard, be nice. Now, that really distresses me. It distressed me then. And I thought, well, we're not changing that. Our children are going to learn how to work hard and to be kind. Because being nice or being kind, lending somebody a pen, holding the door open, helping somebody when they're down, mm -hmm. these are all characteristics that I want all children to have, whether they're white or black. And the idea that a white teacher cannot teach a black child to do those things, as far as I'm concerned, is the racist thing, mm -hmm. not the motto. But then what I've realized now, when I'm tweeting about children working hard, now, three years after that, it's now become unfashionable to work hard. So you can't teach them to be kind. You can't get them to work hard. No. I don't know what we're meant to be doing in school. Frankly. Yeah, well, that's that's really the question, isn't it? What are we meant to be doing? And I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that what seems such a basic, straightforward, albeit, again, focused and regimented structure is designed for the, the benefit of the child, the benefit of the child. Whoops, did we lose Catherine? No, I'm here. Oh, he's still there. Yeah. So qu quick question for you then. Where do these ideas come from? Because as you mentioned, in the 1950s or 60s, much of this would have just been expected. It would have been the status quo in education. Yes. And yet, as you described your own time in the classroom and as an educator, and then of course you're, you're being ousted after having said the wrong thing to the wrong group, where did you come up with the ideas? Uh, how did you design or put the features around Michaela that really are, as you've just described it, where did you get this apart from Kip's uh, banner or Kip's motto? Uh, well, that's the thing, it's interesting. So we have taken ideas from various different schools. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, of course, I'd been working for over 20 years in the system and always working in inner city schools. So I had a sense of what worked and what didn't work. Um, we also started really small with 120 children. So we were able to try out different things and we always had the same values though. We've got to remember the values were relatively, I always call them small C conservative, traditional values. Um, and that's not really a political statement. You know, when I say small C conservative, there are some, there are many big C conservatives that are not small C conservative. And there are many old school lefties, I would say, who are small C conservative. My father is one of those. You know, he mm -hmm. would never vote conservative, but very much a small C conservative. Now, uh, we just tried things out. So, for instance, when we started, we didn't have homework. We now give them loads of homework. In fact, I was just saying three hours, four hours when mm -hmm. they're getting close to their exams. Um, when we started, we didn't have silent corridors. We started with them chatting in the corridor. And then we realized, wait a minute, this is all getting out of hand. They're going to get louder and louder, and this is going to be a problem. Best to just go silent. Um, there, there are various things that we've changed along the way. Uh, the key thing was 
that I knew it could be better than what I had experienced all my life. Because to be honest, there is so much chaos in our public schools and not just here. I was in um, the US in Florida over the summer and spoke to an educational conference there and spoke um, to some teachers there. And they, I mean, the stories, oh my goodness. I mean, Mm -hmm. just in the normal public schools, I mean, it was crazy. And um, and also their systems of discipline. I mean, I remember one teacher telling me that if if there's a fight in his classroom, he has to press a button, and then he waits for a whole boy to come and split up the fight, and that he himself can't get involved in any of it. Mm. And so he presses a button and waits while the kids just fight it out. <laughs> I just I couldn't believe the stories I was hearing, and so yeah, the fact is that um, I knew it could be better. I have to say, I didn't know it could be as good as this. So Mm. I myself, when I go around every now and again, because most of the time I'm in my office talking to staff, meetings, doing webinars like this, um, I don't necessarily get around the school. And every now and again, I go around the school and then I think, wow, it really is fantastic. Because you've got all the kids in all of their lessons listening, hands, tons of hands going up, Mm. just immaculate homework, immaculate books. I mean, and when you go and talk to our kids here, what they know about history and geography and science and so on, it's just, a, it really is a marvel to see, um, which is why teachers come and visit and say, my goodness, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, so we've improved over time. You know, we're- Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, we absolutely undersell or, uh, you know, don't give opportunities to students to be, to to experience their full potential, obviously, right? What you're seeing is the fact that there was more potential than even you realized uh, as yeah. you set out with Michaela. Yeah. I think that the other element that sort of immediately comes to mind in addition to the design that has evolved over these past eight years would be the faculty that you've assembled. And I got to meet just a few of them uh, at, at, when I visited. How do you find teachers who are prepared to promulgate this model because as you've said you you have your detractors and some of them very vociferous and i'm guessing that probably puts you in the crosshairs and probably not something that uh maybe the average teacher would want to be a part of where do you find teachers uh for michaela yeah it was very hard at the beginning and that was just about me going out there and through my various contacts and people who i knew trying to find people of course, we only had six or seven teachers at the beginning because we were only 120 kids. So sure. it was easier to find those few. And then over the years, look, when we advertise, we don't get inundated by applications. But the people who apply, it's self-selecting, isn't it? So mm-hmm. the people who come mm-hmm. want to come here are people who have some sense of what we do. And they think, oh, I'd quite like to try out this traditional thing. But they then come and then like the people you met were not the same people when they first started. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah. we, we go through a whole kind of de brainwashing um, machine kind of thing. And they change their minds about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I, recently, well, in September, when I, I have my, what I called my newbies. So they're my new teachers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I meet with them once a week separately. We do uh, a, a staff meeting for an hour and a half where we do training once a week. And then we also do an hour with just my newbies, just with me. Um, And in one of those first meetings with them, uh, one of them, I was answering a question from another one. And she said, are you just saying that all the left wing ideas in education are wrong? And I said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. (laughs) And she said, you can't say that. And I said, well, not only can I say it, I am saying it. And what's more, in six months' time, you'll be saying it yourself. (laughs) And, you know, it's funny because just before Christmas, she was saying various things and she was saying about her family and how unreasonable they were and how they didn't listen to what she was telling them about what the truth is and what happens in schools. And I said, listen, you know, it's funny how you're saying all this stuff because remember when we had that conversation and I said to you that soon enough, you too would be saying the same thing. And she went, oh, she said, oh my goodness, you're right, you're right. I'm saying just the same things that you've been saying. <laughs> and um, the thing is, people change their minds when they see sure. what works. Mm-hmm. And um, they see, they just see that if they're not ideological. 
So if you're ideological, then it doesn't matter how many times you're shown something that works, you will deny it. You will deny it to your blue in the face, black is white, white is red or whatever. It doesn't matter, you know, but if you're somebody who's open-minded, you're going to change your mind. And that's really what I'm about. The reason why I keep talk, speaking out and doing podcasts and going to conferences and so on is because I'm trying to persuade people of the traditional methods in education, really, because mm -hmm. if you want social mobility or deprived children, that's the only way you're going to get it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's fascinating that you've come to uh, sort of a, a lexicon of small C conservative, as you call it, of the tradition being made fashionable, uh, words that obviously have some uh, history behind them. The tradition itself is uh, bring that you bring to bear. But I, I'm again, I continue to sort of think through how you are persuading others. And it, and it sounds as though primarily you do so with the efficacy, the example, the presentation itself. Come and see for yourself. And yes. then we can talk about what works. Yes. If that's the case, then I'm hearing, and obviously we titled this podcast knowing we'd get around to the notion of school culture. I'm hearing repeatedly that culture is very much at the fore of your work. And as you describe the assimilation of your faculty, it seems to me that what you're doing is acculturating them, right, to yes. a way of educating the young. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about the culture and maybe about that assimilation process with faculty. What are some of the things, again, in, in, in not just in the categories of left or right or somewhere progressive or otherwise traditional, what are some of those features that you're really promulgating uh, as you talk to those faculty and try to, to assimilate them to the, to the Michaela model? Yeah, so one way is we have a whole system of candor. So we have to be really candid with each other all the time and be very straight with feedback mm -hmm. so that people can improve. And we're not just saying things to, to make you feel better, um, mm -hmm. that we're trying very much to get everybody on the same page, to understand that we're all on each other's side, that we're all trying to deliver something as a team. So if somebody is critical of what you're doing, it's because they're trying to help you to get better. Uh -huh. And that is something that we push in a very big way so that people will go and seek feedback. They'll say, come and watch me teach this lesson. I'm a bit worried. I'm my presence. I need to improve on my presence. How can come and give me some advice? Or, you know, I'm not so hot on my explanations. Come and watch me. Tell me what you think I should be doing differently. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our, our, our kind of observations, and I call them observations because they're not really observations. So observations in this country, normally somebody sits in the back of your classroom with some kind of clipboard and they're writing and they're grading you and they're grading you according to some pro forma that they've got. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go to their office and they type it all up and it takes ages. And this is for a lesson that they booked in for it. It's three weeks in advance. We don't do that because I'm not interested in you, your performance as a SEAL. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in what you do every day. Mm -hmm. So teachers are in and out of each other's lessons constantly. And they go on their phones and they write quick feedback, which might take 15 minutes to the teacher as you are watching. Oh, yep. yep. See how little Johnny did blah, blah. You should have tried this instead. Oh, see this. Da, 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 da. And then they send it to the teacher. Um, and so you get instant feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher only needs to spend 15 minutes in there to give you some direct feedback that's going to help. Um, when newbies start, so our new staff, they get feedback practically in every lesson. So, you know you know, elsewhere, you might, as a teacher in another school, get observed twice a year if you're lucky. Right, Here, right. You're observed twice a day, you know, mm -hmm. and when you're new, more than that. And now, as you, once you've been here for a year or two, you're not getting observed that much. Sure. You're observed maybe once every few weeks, you know, and, um, but there's no grading. There's just a, I'm just checking in, giving you a bit of advice and off I go. So that's the culture of improvement. And we have what's called a candor chart where you get a star every time you give somebody candor and they get a star for receiving the candor. Then at the end of the term, I throw out chocolate bars to the people who are <laughs> so That changes the atmosphere. You know, the sure. culture is one of, of us being honest and trusting of each other. Mm -hmm. um, so other things in terms of the culture, uh, we believe in kids working hard and being kind. And we believe very much that uh, what we understand that putting a child in detention is a kind thing to do. We mm. understand that uh, we are looking uh, ahead at their future and doing what is necessary now to make sure that they are going to have the skills and knowledge to achieve that future. 
So we're not about uh, how we feel in the moment. I would argue that people who are against that kind of thing and don't want to be strict with kids, whether they're parents or teachers, um, you know, uh, 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 one of my staff sent me this wonderful quote today about how it said, you can be friends with your kid, you can be friends with your kids when they're kids, or you can be friends with your kids when they're adults. You can't have both, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. That really sums up how we think, which is that if you're all, if we're friends with the kids now, they're going to be mm -hmm. horrible adults, right? Mm -hmm. It's our job as adults. Kids push, we push back. That is what we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, I think uh, the, the small c conservative value of duty has been lost in the modern world. We have a duty to these children to do our jobs mm -hmm. as adults, you know? And um, look, they're kids. They're going to be naughty. That's what kids do. It's our job to make sure that we're really clear about our high expectations and what we want from them and to expect them to work to meet that, whether mm -hmm. that's in terms of delivering their homework, whether that's in terms of being polite, whether that's putting our hand up and answering questions. Another thing I'd say that's really key about our culture is that we celebrate achievement. So in too many classrooms, I would say that the children who uh, know a lot and work hard are considered to be the nerds. Mm -hmm. Watch any of those films, you know, The Breakfast Club, or I mean, I'm, of course, I'm showing my age by talking about The Breakfast Club. But, um, you know, I've seen it, Catherine. I've seen it. <laughs> those the, the the kids that are cool are the yeah. kids who are in detention. Mm -hmm. The kids who are cool are the ones not doing their work. Right. Um, and you never see films about the good kids in school ever, ever. I mean, they're just not made mm -hmm. because they're not interesting. Mm -hmm. When actually, those are the kids who need to set the culture. So you want all your kids desperately trying to be the best and know the most answers and the hands up all the time mm -hmm. as opposed to gosh if i put my hand up everybody's going to think i'm the one i'm teacher's pet sure uh, we have phrases like that teacher's yep. pet what yep. is that i mean we don't have a teacher's pet thing here because everybody is desperate to show that they've got the answer they know that they want the merit etc so we have a real culture of achievement a real culture of uh, a real celebration staff are supportive of each other and we are really delivering for these kids and the kids most importantly they're delivering for themselves yeah yeah that's absolutely right and i saw that and i was going to add that if, if uh you know if celebration is is central to the work you're doing that it comes across there's a joy that i yes. witnessed at the lunch table and in the yes. classroom uh yes. because of that achievement and that uh, aspiration, right? The yes. children all desiring to 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 run ahead as fast as they can and as yes. as quickly as possible. I I saw in in your 2020 book, The Power of Culture, that you'd essentially assembled from your faculty a variety of comments on this. Are there other uh, other folks that you're enlisting in this work? Obviously, your own faculty to to write this up and communicate this to the broader world. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, my teachers understand what we're doing. I mean, we've had a, a large number of journalists who have come through the school, as well as politicians who have come through the school. Um, and just, I mean, lots and lots of people. So I would say that the word is is spread just by word of mouth mm -hmm. about Michaela. And then people say, you've got to go see it, got to go see it. Uh, so that coupled with the books, and then also um, one of our television channels here, ITV, did a documentary uh, about the school, which came mm -hmm. out in May last year. And it can be accessed on um, uh, the, the producer's website, which is called strictestheadmistress.com. Ah, this is a there we go. Title, strictestheadmistress.com. Yep. And yep. if you go on there, you will see uh, this documentary where we have 12 rules that we've come up with. Um, that uh, you need to follow in order to, as a parent or as a teacher, you, you, this is what you need to be able to raise children properly. Mm -hmm. And oh. you get to see the school and you get to see the kids and you get to see what goes on at Michaela. So if anybody kind of, the reason, the reason why I finally agreed, because there were so many people that asked us to do a documentary sure. and eventually I agreed. And the reason I did was because I thought to myself, there's only so many people can actually come inside the school and see it. But like all of you, you guys in America, you can't necessarily get over here. Right, right. So if you want to see the school, you can watch that that documentary, and you'll actually teachers find it invaluable as um, 
training. You know, they really like it. Leaders in education and also ordinary teachers in the classroom, mm. they really uh, appreciate the advice that they get through that documentary. We're going to be sure to include that in the show notes uh, so that folks who want to learn more about Michaela Community School can do so. We're going to take a quick break. I'll let you grab a cup of coffee or water or whatever you have, and uh, we'll be right back with Catherine Verbalsing. Okay. Today's webinar is sponsored by Classical Academic Press, one of the leading publishers in classical education and creators of Latin for Children. Latin for Children is tailored for kids grades four to seven. It includes student and teacher editions, history readers with level appropriate stories to translate. There are activity books and video and audio resources as well. The incorporation of songs and chants helps students to memorize the tricky parts of Latin while having fun with the process. And this is a practice, of course, that's helped children learn Latin since the time of the Romans. It's suitable for parents who do or do not know Latin themselves, and we would encourage you to check it out. Uh, the free shipping code, ICE Latin, will be active until January 31st. We'll post that as well in the show notes, but we want to thank Classical Academic Press for their support of this Virtue Podcast. And we'll come back to Catherine. Catherine, thanks so much. We're going to take a few questions perhaps from our audience that's here with us live and uh, let uh, let the team put those up as need be. I do wanna ask, you know, the phrasing here that you had, uh, and I saw this on your website as well, that you're making tradition fashionable. Uh, and, you, and you mentioned repeatedly the value of uh, the small C conservative values. Uh, how is it that the tradition has come down to you? By this, I'm thinking, what are some of the things that you're reading with your faculty? Uh, what are you watching and, and, and describing for them so that this tradition becomes something that, that they can imbibe, right? That they can assimilate to? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. We read all sorts of things and not necessarily stuff that's ancient. I right. mean, you know, it's true. I've got C.S. Lewis quoted up on over there and we might refer to some of the stuff that C.S. Lewis says, but I would say, like I made everybody read The War on the West by Douglas Murray. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I even played in some, one of our staff meetings, I played some from Audible. I played one section of it so we could all listen to it. Why? Because I think he does a great job of explaining uh, why the Western tradition is a good one and why we should fight to keep it and why and how it's being destroyed right now because i need my teachers to understand that this is a fight you know often i find that teachers don't necessarily understand that and people might think i'm exaggerating when i'm saying things like it's you know we will be the end of the west unless we do something you know so that's a book that i made everybody read but then there's other books there are some um so edie hirsch or edie hirsch uh who, as you'll know, is all about um, knowledge and prizing knowledge and teaching children uh, with knowledge as center in your classroom, as opposed to this idea of children being in groups and, um, and, and, and teaching transferable skills. We imagine that we, we, we let knowledge go by the wayside. Edie Hirsch very, very much values that. So any of his books, uh, the schools we need and why we don't have them, knowledge matters. I don't know. There's a number of books mm -hmm. of his. There's also your, I say your as American, uh, Dan Willingham, who is a cognitive scientist who writes about why children don't like school. Um, and again, he's talking about the ways in which they're being taught, that they're not being taught with knowledge uh, as central as part of the classroom. But then we also might read um, some of your uh, more black conservative uh, writers like Jason Riley. He's written a book, Please Stop Helping Us, he's writing to the liberal left and saying, look, actually, you're not helping us by doing this. Or we might read or watch because I send podcasts out as well. So John McWhorter, but I think he would consider himself to be a Democrat um, or some Coleman Hughes, who, again, would call himself a Democrat or Glenn Lowry, who I think probably calls himself a conservative. That's all stuff I would have people watch. Um, and then there's stuff that, uh, there's um, a great little book called uh, Generation F, which is by a British author. We don't even know who it is. He's anonymous. He was a huh. 
-hmm. and he worked in social work and in within the, the, the within government and he's just sort of exposing the kind of um madness that he's having to deal with in terms of the bureaucracy in terms of the inertia and so on so that's a great book that we get people to read um I've just been reading this fantastic, I haven't added this to my list for staff, but there's this great new book by Andrew Doyle, who's one of ours, called The New Puritans. And um, it's just a brilliant way of, it's a brilliant analysis of what is going on in our world right now, Western world, and why it is people are rejecting uh, sensible ideas that should help, let's say, the deprived, uh, mm -hmm. who everyone claims to want to help. You know, my books are over there, that's our staff library there. So, oh, I don't know. We have a book called The Welfare State We're In that I have people read. Again, it's about the welfare state, the damage that it can do uh, when you just farm everything out to the state and say, leave the state to it, as opposed to encouraging families to take personal responsibility, small C conservative values, each child taking personal responsibility, each family taking personal responsibility, being part of a community that you give back to because you have a duty towards them to give back to them. Mm -hmm. and impact. So what other books do we have? You know, I mentioned you, you uh, I, I saw at least a Roger Scruton quotation on the wall and I was wondering, did you get to know the late uh, Sir Roger Scruton at some point? Did you have a yes. chance to meet him? Very much so. And, um, he, his books are over there too. It's just that those are books that people have to graduate to because they're so hard to understand. <laughs> well, so. they're, they're a bit thick. I agree. I agree. There's a theoretical element or level of, of, of difficulty. Yeah. And yet he's probably one of the most articulate and eloquent spokespersons for uh, yeah. beauty, uh, for the nature of the aesthetic and the cultural tradition that uh, that I think you're you're attempting to, to pass along. Yeah. So he came. He came to me. He did. He came. What, what were his impressions? Well. Well, you know what? I think we really, we changed his mind about stuff, actually. Mm. I mean, I, I feel slightly arrogant saying that I changed Roger Scruton's <laughs> mind, but I'm telling you, he, um, I think he came to see, visiting here, that it was possible for kids whose backgrounds were not English, so their grandparents were from Somalia and Nigeria and Jamaica and India and so on, and that these children could come to inherit a British tradition and for it to be very much their own. Mm -hmm. And I think before he came, I know, because he said to me, before he came here, he wasn't quite sure of that. And that's because I don't think it's been happening much anywhere because sure. people don't believe in traditionalism. They don't believe in teaching children to belong to their country. We sing God Save the King. I was about to say mm -hmm. Queen. <laughs> yep. God Save the King. We sing other hymns that are um, very much uh, patriotic songs. The children very much believe they're British, whatever color they are. And um, Roger was just so impressed by uh, the, the the curriculum that we were teaching them British history. Mm -hmm. And that while we, we, we taught both the good and the bad, and we weren't constantly apologizing for being British. Right. Um, and he he just saw a sense of belonging where all of these children had these multicultural backgrounds but that we all belonged to our country hmm. you know and so he i mean i stupidly if i could redo it gosh you know i had him come and speak about fox hunting and i had him come and talk about fox hunting because <laughs> I, I knew he loved fox hunting and in fact he he wrote a book about fox hunting which he gave to me it was very sweet and i will you know treasure it forever um but he came and he talked about killing the foxes. And the reason why it, it was it, I wanted him to talk about that was because I thought, well, what will the children enjoy and find interesting? Now, if you grow up in the inner city, you've ne fox hunting is totally alien to you. Mm -hmm. Because fox hunting in Britain is a real tradition. They wear these red coats. They have these bugles. They have the dogs that go running out. And it's this whole big thing. And of course, we in the city don't know about this. So I thought he could come and he could explain to us about the tradition. And he did. I have to say, I don't think he convinced anybody of the tradition. <laughs> the, the foxes being ripped apart, the children are all going, <laughs> um, So I wish I'd had him come and talk to staff instead. And I wish I'd videoed him. And of course, you don't really realize that time is short, you know, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. he might not be here forever. But, right, sad, right. you know, but he did, he came and he, he loved it. And I do think it had real impact on his thinking. Well, I'm certain that he was supportive. I can only imagine what he saw because I witnessed some of it myself and how it would have affected him because he is concerned for how 
to promulgate the tradition. He's he, all of his books, all of the videos, all of the things that he is did, that he did over his long life were intended as yeah. uh, an extension of and, and yeah. really a promotion of the tradition. Yeah. He he was very much interested in concern that beauty was in abeyance, that beauty was waning in our in our in our culture. Uh, and I'm wondering how beauty factors into the Michaela community. How do you think about that in particular? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question because, um, you know, we are in this ugly office building, uh, which, and the reason why we're here is because all our detractors worked so hard to stop us from getting a decent building. We're right next to the trains and they make loads of noise. And we have this tiny little yard, which has got asphalt on it. That It used to be a car park. In fact, there is no car park for the staff because mm. uh, we have to use that small space for the children. Right. So... When you look at our building, it really isn't very beautiful. Um, but what we've done is we've made it our home as best we can. So when you come inside, everything is clean and straight lines and the walls are white. And we haven't got the walls covered with tons of posters mm -hmm. and with blue tack falling off everywhere and broken mm -hmm. handles and, and old textbooks lying all over the place. Everything is ordered and beautiful, as beautiful as it can be, given uh, the restraints of the building, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes a real difference to children because I often think that there is a mistake that we make in teaching that we think if we plaster, I mean, as a young teacher, I did this. You plaster your walls with all kinds of posters and all kinds. I used to spend my own money buying materials and gluing them and, 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 yep. and uh, laminating them and cutting them up and putting all this stuff up. And actually, just keeping everything simple and plain means that the children can concentrate on the teacher mm -hmm. and they're not being distracted by just all the noise around, you know? Mm -hmm. And because, of course, we are quite strict and we have very high standards of behavior, it means that our doors don't get kicked in, the windows don't get broken, the, the, I'm never having to repair the walls. We do a little bit of painting every summer. Um, but that's it. We don't have huge expenses when it comes to fixing sure. the building. So I would say that, yeah, that's th th that is one way. Now, of course, then there's the other way of we want them to access the best that's been thought and said. Mm -hmm. So we're choosing beautiful literature. We're choosing beautiful music. Every morning, every single class in the school listens to some classical music. Mm -hmm. and they're told who it is. This is Bach. This is Beethoven. This is from the Romantic period. This is from the Baroque period, whatever. And and they listen to it and they learn something about mm -hmm. classical music because we think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're trying very hard to. Oh, and I should also say their uniform. So all of the children wear very smart mm -hmm. uniforms. It's not expensive, but it's very smart. And their shirts have to be tucked in and their ties are always to the top. And they they, they walk with pride. They don't wear their coats when they're in the in the school. They're not allowed. Their coats are hung up at the back of their classroom. So are their bags. You will he see in schools, kids cap their coats and their bags and everything's such a mess. Everything for us is clean. So they have their lovely blazers, march down the corridors looking smart, and they don't carry all their books in some bag. They have a work pack, and it's this transparent pack, and they put everything inside, and they each carry their little packs, and they look sophisticated, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you go for a job interview, when you are somebody important in life, you want to be sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So are my teachers sophisticated? You don't see my teachers turning up in jean jackets and, and ripped jeans and so on. Mm -hmm. They're everybody smart. Everybody, you know, everybody makes an effort because we're in work. And That's work right. should mean something as opposed to looking like you're hanging around in your pajamas on a Friday <laughs> evening, you know? So all of that matters, I think, because it does. You're just you feel like you're at school for a purpose, you know? Yes, that's you're right. You're for something. That's right. And I know that's a lot right. of people will say that's not true. Well, I I mean, that's because I'm a traditionalist, and so that's why I think the way that I do. Well, as you said, hundreds, even thousands have come and seen it for themselves, and you always welcome newcomers and visitors. Yeah. So uh, if they don't believe it, and if uh, if they can't believe what they're hearing, then they just need to find opportunity either to, to, to look at the video or to come and yes. visit Michaela at some point. Yes. Are your families uh, bought into this program? How do they respond to uh, this very distinctive model uh, with yeah. their children? So it's an interesting question because the thing is we don't choose our families. The local council gives us our kids. Now, uh, the system here in, in, in England is that uh, you can choose six schools 
um, and then you send it to the local council and they'll do their best to get you your top choice school. Now, obviously, if you've chosen a school fourth, fifth or sixth, you don't really want it. Right. Mm -hmm. But you've got you're meant to put down these six schools. Um, the kids that come here, some of them will have chosen us first, maybe a quarter if you're lucky. Three quarters of them have not chosen us first. That means mm -hmm. they wanted to go somewhere else. And actually, a number of children who start here at the beginning uh, will end up on waiting lists for other schools wanting to go somewhere else because their families didn't actually choose us first. I mean, there are enough right. for six. You know, we've got we're oversubscribed in terms of choosing putting us on the list, but not necessarily first. But then what always happens, and it's fascinating, they're on waiting lists to go somewhere else. And then six weeks or six months later, they get the place at the other school. And when their parent says, well, let's change you, they don't want to leave. They want to stay. So the child is very much bought into what they're getting here. Because as soon as they start, they realize they're learning so much more here than they learned at primary school. Mm -hmm. And they're learning so much more than their friends are learning at other secondary schools. So the thing I always say is that the kids are more than willing to put up with the strict discipline when they know in return, they get a great education. Mm -hmm. So then the parents kind of think, well, you know what? My kid is really happy. My kid comes home with homework and he always gets on with it on his own. It makes my life easier. My kid is, is really happy at school and has friends and is learning loads. Well, it's a no brainer. We'll just keep him where he is. So look, some parents of course have chosen us and have got in because they've chosen us and they're sure. absolutely thrilled. And then the others, come on board gradually there are some who i don't think ever come on board but they're here because their kids are happy here mm. and the kid wants to stay so they put up with me telling them things like you better get them here on time otherwise i'll be telling you <laughs> off for being a bad parent <laughs> well the happy factor is palpable as i said i witnessed it myself and i think you've you've stumbled upon a secret that maybe as timeless or as perennial as anything uh, that structure and form, even something that might appear to be regimentation, ultimately, paradoxically, produces a kind of joy-filled order. And That's it. Uh, and, and That's I it. and I, I think you're I think you're on to it. That's it. We, well, let me just comment on what you just said there. Yes, the thing please. is, is that people mistake, they think that to make children creative, to to enable creativity, to enable independent thought, you want to just let them go. That is not the way to do it. It's through order and structure. And through giving them knowledge that they then have the confidence and the skills and the knowledge to be creative and to come up with their own ideas. Mm -hmm. You cannot think independently about something that you know nothing about. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to know something about it is if you're in a classroom where you can hear the teacher, where the kids are all wanting to put their hands up and learn, where you are motivated to work hard, where you go home and do that homework because you want to pass that quiz with flying, flying colors tomorrow. That is how you help deprive children, be uh, creative, outspoken, interesting, knowledgeable, and so on. And that is what we're in the business of doing. But sadly, it's like you say, it's counter, it's counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but that's it. But that, that, that is the solution. That's the magic. And you are certainly the, the, the one who's bringing it to Michaela. So thank you for that, Catherine. We're delighted because you're going to be joining us in Phoenix later yes. next month. And uh, we'll be talking about this, among other things. So uh, looking forward to seeing you here in sunny Phoenix later yes. in February. I'm very much looking forward to it. It'll be, I can't wait. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time this afternoon, this morning. Uh, appreciate just how much uh, you're putting into that community and I uh, look forward to getting to, to have you here in person. Great. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. You bet. Registration for the 2023 National Symposium for Classical Education is now open. Join us February 22nd through the 24th in Phoenix, Arizona for three days of unsurpassed scholarship, professional workshops, and networking opportunities. For more information, visit www.greathearts.institute. Working together to renew.